Welcome to My Favorite Mystic, a podcast about the weird and wonderful world of mysticism. I'm your host, AJ Langley, and today I'm joined by Georgia Van Ralta. She's recently finished her PhD at the University of Surrey, and her work focuses on the occult novels of the woman she's here to speak about today, Dion Fortune. Georgia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me today. My pleasure. Now, before we start talking about Dion Fortune, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Can you please tell us how you first became interested in the academic world of esotericism? I actually did my undergrad degree in Christian theology. And one day when I was trying to decide what to do for my MA, I found a poster advertising a course in the study of esotericism. I thought, ooh, that sounds really cool. And I ended up moving to Amsterdam and doing an MA in it on the basis of that poster. That sounds like a very effective poster. What I found really fascinating about esotericism was that a lot of Christian mysticism, there's quite a lot of repetition and arguing about, you know, the same text that scholars have been arguing about for 2000 years. And suddenly I found this whole world where there was all these incredible mystical texts that nobody had ever studied. And I just thought it was the most fascinating thing. And especially suddenly this vista of women mystics who I had never heard of and who nobody had ever heard of was opened up before me. And I found that really fascinating and I've been exploring it ever since. Just to get some terminology out of the way, could you give us a layman's definition of esotericism? I can certainly try. <laughs> um, so esotericism is, one might call it the heterodox mysticism of the West, at least in how it's studied in the academy today, the Western aspects being problematized more now. But generally speaking, it's all of the tangents of religion and mysticism that have never been fully accepted or considered mainstream. And Vada Hanegraaff, one of the main theorists, say that they follow a red thread through history from the Neoplatonists and the Pythagoreans through Gnosticism and such like up through Kabbalah and into the sort of heterodox Christian mystical traditions of the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. That is a very large playground. What aspects of esotericism are you the most interested in? My work explores more 19th and 20th century esotericism, which is when we get to the occult revival and you're talking about theosophy, the hermetic order of the Golden Dawn, people like Aleister Crowley and Dion Fortune. They were all operating within a broadly Christian paradigm, but very much a heterodox one. Which really, to me, the main point was that as opposed to a lot of uh, forms of Christianity, which emphasized canon, particularly Catholicism, these forms of heterodox spirituality really focused on personal experience. They saw that as being connected to the early Gnostics and this more intimate relationship with God. They're often not really referred to as mystics, but called occultists and esotericists, but really they are mystics. So speaking of mystics, let's move on to the person you are here to speak about today. Tell us a little bit about Dion Fortune. So Dion Fortune was born Violet May Firth. She began life as a psychotherapist. And in fact, she was one of the earliest women psychoanalysts in the UK. She was also brought up in a Christian science background, which was a sort of occult form of Christianity of the period. And she got into esotericism and occultism left psychoanalysis behind and wrote a series of books both on practical occultism, the theory of it, and her occult novels, which she believed would inspire and even initiate mystical experience in the people who read them. She also ran a successful occult order that had its headquarters in London. She ran talks and people came and lived in this big house and practiced magic together and such. And she ran an occult bed and breakfast in Glastonbury. And it's not quite clear where the money came from for this. She'd written a lot about Glastonbury and she decided to, or was given some land there and created corrugated iron shelters where people could come and camp out very cheap and, you know, absorb the forces that came from the springs, do their thing at Glastonbury. Although there was a sort of a cult attachment to Glastonbury at this time, Blythe Bond famously channeled the information to show where the Glastonbury Abbey ruins were. She was one of the really instrumental people in bringing together the Glastonbury mythos. And she wrote a book called Avalon of the Heart that argued that Glastonbury was the center of Celtic Christianity in the UK. And she continued to operate her society and actually lived in London through the Blitz, refusing to leave London behind. 
She did a lot of uh, meditation and energy work throughout the Second World War, which was the inspiration for Bedknobs and Broomsticks, where they cast the Nazis off the cliff. And she died of probably leukemia in 1946. And was she quite influential in her time? And she usually gets lumped along with Aleister Crowley, sort of the infamous boogeyman of 20th century occultism. And Crowley is a lot more well known today, but actually Fortune was far more successful in her lifetime. She managed to keep her society afloat with her writing, maintain property in London and Glastonbury. She did a correspondence course, which were popular in the period, and she would send out reading and questions all over the UK and indeed all over the globe. And then people would send back their answers. And once you had completed that, you would be invited to come to London to take the next stage of your work. The society was called, it started as the Christian Mystic Lodge, which was a section of the Theosophical Society aimed at the Grail Mysteries and Celtic Christianity. But it became the Fraternity of the Inner Light and then later the Society of the Inner Light. Okay, so what is the Inner Light? Well, <laughs> precisely. Um, that's a very sort of esoteric concept with normal mysticism, you know, the sort of the normal mysticism, but the sort of the concept of the God without, you know, sky daddy, sun god type thing. But within esotericism in particular, when we're talking about the ability of an individual to experience God, they're often speaking of a sort of inner light, which is your inner component of godhood or your inner spark, which is a very Gnostic idea, of course. Why have none of these mystics ever written something called In Search of Sky Daddy? That's what I really want to know. <laughs> Sky Daddy and Earth Mama. Exactly. <laughs> and, and Fortune's very interesting in this because a lot of esotericists or occultists of the 20th century were quite intent on rejecting Christianity. But Fortune was a Christian her whole life, a very dedicated one, just of a form of Christianity that would have had her burnt several hundred years ago. <laughs> But she truly believed that this sort of light within was this Christian concept and that true Christian mysticism involved inward seeking. And so they were very big on personal growth and self-understanding, as well as more mystical techniques. So given the cultural obsession with them over the last couple of years, I almost would be remiss if I didn't ask, was this considered a cult rather than just a cult? That is a question of definitions, the use of the word cult. So occult means hidden or veiled. And the idea was that this occult knowledge was hidden knowledge, knowledge that had been hidden through history, how to contact God, how to have mystical experiences, etc. And particularly how to contact other gods or demons or such like. Cult started becoming uh, more of a thing in Fortune's period. And there was this famous called the Awada cult, where a man and woman had been claiming that they were taking people in for occult training. And it turned out they were seducing them and doing all sorts of horrible things. And there were a few of these controversies, and this made occultism quite infamous and problematic. But Dion Fortune was very committed to making a form of occultism that young middle-class women could join without feeling that they had to give up their place in society. So I would say emphatically no, although, again, it would depend quite how you're defining it. People certainly came and lived in her group, and she was a very charismatic leader, but she would have been resolute that what she was doing was helping people and helping the larger culture as well as individuals. And there isn't any examples of her really doing anything particularly coercive or mean. So no coercing, brainwashing, isolation, manipulation, robbing blind of people that we see in modern day cults in the popular understanding. No. And I mean, to be fair, Crowley, who often is called a cult leader, didn't do any of that really either. There is some question of when occult techniques become more problematic when you get the lines between hypnotism and mesmerism and charismatic teachers. But Fortune was very, very intent on resisting this. And actually, after her death, she asked for all of her papers and library to be burnt so that they couldn't make a cult of personality around the things that she'd written. So one of the problems facing researchers today is there is no primary material on her. I respect the intentions, but as a historian, I am thoroughly appalled. No, no, I was going to say it is It is the crazy thing about researching Dion Fortune is there's about 10 letters written from or to her and then her published works. And that is it. There is nothing else publicly available. Although Gareth Knight, who's the current leader of the society, which is still going today and still accepts members, he has had a project of publishing as much of her unpublished material as he could get his hands on. So there is quite a lot available today. 
but again from an academic perspective it's been edited by this dude who claims to channel fortune and there's no way to get at the original papers so that's quite tricky and when you know there would have been so much more there too that's just heartbreaking Ugh, okay we need to move on so did she have mystical experiences of her own she did very much so. So she was a practicing occultist, which generally means she went in for ceremonial magic, big rituals, sort of pseudo Catholic, pseudo Masonic type things. But she was also a medium, spirit medium, and she wrote channel texts. And on top of this, she had several deep, what I might call pure mystical, as in uh, unsought for experiences. The first of which she had when working at a laboratory on um, soybean research during the First World War. And she had a vision of the masters who she believed were sort of the grand initiatory forces at work in the world and who set her off on her occult path. Tell me more about these masters. Well, it's a theosophical concept. Madame Blavatsky utilized the idea of Indian masters very heavily. And they were always male and even fortunes were always male. But one of the very interesting things is that the Theosophical Society had used these for authority, but they were Indian. So they had Indian masters who were the secret teachers behind Theosophy. Fortune, who was far more focused on sort of Western culture, had Western masters. She didn't quite believe they were actually people from the past, but kind of broad forces and such that she could engage with and that would guide her or show her where she needed to develop. You mentioned that she was a lifelong Christian. So how does this fit into that worldview? Well, she believed that Christ was one of the masters. He was the master of the mystic ray, but there was also a master of the hermetic ray and one of the green ray, which was nature mysticism. Okay, so there are only the three. There's some complication. In the early vision, it's just three. Some of her later theoretical work goes on to talk about seven different rays. And there's not always necessarily a clear quite clear that she knew what necessarily she had even seen which of course is kind of goes with the mystical experience but broadly she believed that there were three rays of mysticism and you could do christian mysticism you could do nature mysticism or you could do hermetic mysticism which was following more traditional esoteric approaches and she believed everyone needed to do all of them so although people would naturally be drawn to one a true initiate would be able to do all of them and in fact that first experience of them she got told that she had to pursue nature mysticism even though she didn't want to because that was where she was most deficient okay so even though you might have an inclination or a proficiency in one area you need to be more well-rounded as a mystic yes yes and that a real mystic would have all three and that it's perhaps unnatural to only focus on one of the rays. So is there a construction of an ideal mystic in these texts? No, but there is a sort of ideal initiate. She speaks of initiates rather than mystics. So in the training work of an initiate, she speaks about the way that initiation happens through these masters and what the ideal model of an initiate looks like and does. So does Fortune develop this kind of spirituality as a reaction to the increasing popularity of Indian spirituality in Britain at the time? Yes, very much so. She saw the forms of Tantra and Hinduism that were coming to the UK, not necessarily as being negative as pro or problematic, but she just thought it was inappropriate for Westerners, uh, which is a sort of subtlety, but is really what she was kind of building a lot of her work on was oh no, all of these British people are getting taught Tantra and they're not ready for it. So I'm going to teach them the British magic that they are kind of ready for because they've been brought up with myths of Arthur and such like. So was she anti-Indian more generally or is this purely about the appropriateness of the spirituality? She does make anti-Indian statements, but she also makes statements that say that she really thinks Indian spirituality is important and it's brought very important things. She just thought that we needed to not lose what she saw as the Western traditions in the face of this new influx. So some acknowledgement of its importance, but definitely some racism happening here. She was certainly a racist and she was involved in eugenics movements, as many occultists were in this period. Uh, we have the same sort of thing with late medieval Christian mystics in that there is a lot of anti-Semitism in their texts, and that makes it difficult to read them and difficult to work with them sometimes, because it's just really unpleasant stuff. No, very, very much so. And it's one of the reasons her work isn't studied, because people go, well, she had these horrible opinions on, uh, you know, she thought priests should be in charge of who got to mate with each other. 
she had some very very weird opinions but we have to contextualize it and we really have to see the way that she wasn't saying something bizarre or weird in this period which is upsetting all on its own yeah it's it's tricky and kind of often unpleasant stuff but i think it really has to be examined because so much of the new age milieu now has quite directly absorbed a lot of this racism and it's not talked about examining sort of historically where these ideas first came from is really useful. And especially because the eugenics movement is still linked with occultism a lot of the times. That's It's really scary, actually, especially when you see sort of uh, Norse paganism being linked with it. And you're thinking, people are still doing this 100 years later? So yeah, no, it's fascinating, but deeply unpleasant stuff at times. Absolutely. And I think you're right. It's really important to acknowledge that these things do exist in these texts rather than just sweeping them under the rug. But on to more pleasant things. Can you tell us a little bit about her published works then, since that's all we have, thanks to her own wishes? What kind of things did she write? Well, she wrote a massive corpus of works. So yeah, she wrote some very practical stuff. She wrote something called Psychic Self-Defense and something called Sane Occultism, which were both aimed at unmystifying contemporary occult practices but she also wrote very complex mystical texts like the mystical Kabbalah that I have here and something called the cosmic doctrine which is a completely channeled and largely unreadable text that was aimed at her private mystical group rather than a broader audience. Why is it unreadable? Well it's a channeled text I mean I'm sure I'll get somebody go ah it's not unreadable but it's it doesn't actually um it's very interesting when you start looking at the history of how, you know, channeled experiences work and such like, that it doesn't really read like her other work. It does read like somebody else wrote it, or at least someone wrote it attempting a different voice. And it's very dense. If you imagine like Karl Barth, but mixed with all this occultism I'm talking about, that's very heavy on the sort of structuralism. And this is the grand overview of how the world works, but completely enmeshed in esoteric terminology. I mean, when you put it like that, it doesn't seem like a particularly easy read. But let's talk about her novels now. You mentioned earlier that she believed her novels had the ability to initiate mystical experiences. Can you elaborate on that? She believed that her novels had initiatory potential, and she writes about this in articles, that for those who have the ears to hear and are ready for this, that the novels will inspire them to new understandings of the world and to seek and to chase occult workings, I suppose. They sort of practically give instructions on how to do occultism, but at the same time, they're very much aimed at riling up the spirit to start seeking more, particularly with regards to uh, not sexuality, but sort of erotic landscapes. And they rely very heavily on the use of the fantasizing ability of the reader. So she believed that for people who had, you know, a very responsive and active imagination, that they wouldn't just read these books and then be done, that they would enter into these books and start having their own relationships with the characters or with the ideas and the gods in them, and that that would lead them to their own initiatory or mystic experiences. I think what I love about her novels is that they sort of reify something that's implicit in literature more generally. So everyone knows that fantasy stories cause you to go off and create your own fantasies and everyone knows that literature can have a very profound effect but very few people talk about how initiatory ideas are transmitted through texts even though that has been very entwined with religious textuality and things like this and even things today about the popularity of books like Lord of the Rings that has this huge cultural transformation Tolkien was writing in the same period as Fortune, and he was very much concerned with the same issues of transforming British culture into this better thing. That's why I find it so fascinating. Tolkien's an interesting comparison, actually, because he also didn't want a cult of personality. That was a concern for him as well. There are quite a few similarities, actually, there, interestingly. And Charles Williams, who was one of the Inklings and was a good friend of Tolkien, was also a member of one or two occult societies and was actually involved in practical occultism. So there's definitely some connections to be found there. Okay, so we know the purpose of these novels, but how many of them did she actually write and what are they about? So she wrote four novels that she called her occult novels. She also wrote an earlier novel, a book of short stories, and then four pot boilers. 
Now, the pot boilers being more just like sensation fiction of very questionable quality, and they were only very recently republished as an interest piece. But the occult novels have been in print since they were produced, although they haven't been wildly popular. They all follow romance stories set in the 30s and 40s in England, and they all tell the story of a lost man discovering occultism and a woman and sort of together learning about how to live a better life through practical occultism. So they sort of teach you some of what Fortune felt were the basics of occult practice. Things like how to do a ritual, how to make your life, you know, reflect the things that you want from it, things like this. But then they both are supposed to provide sort of a new fantasy landscape for you. They're supposed to sort of encourage you to imagine you're in this book and imagine if you had this connection with this goddess, because she thought if you started thinking, wow, Imagine if I spoke to Isis and then you made your bedroom all pretty, that that would really actually give you an opportunity to connect with that power. And arguably the approach she took is very much the approach that you see in modern occultism and witchcraft. So I think she was pretty much onto something. There's a sort of a two pronged approach in that she was trying to teach practical occultism and practical techniques. But equally, she was hoping that she could inspire sort of occult fantasies in her readers that would set them off realizing that there was more to sex and more to religion than they'd realized and that they were intertwined and that they could sort of fantasize themselves out of the situations they found themselves in. So what is the end goal or the point of this process? Well, I mean, it's initiation. And this is why all the people in her books are very disenfranchised. The point is simply that if you are happy with life, mundane life, then there's no point. But if you are someone who always feels like there's more and you're terribly, you know, sick of life as it is, et cetera, et cetera, that practical occultism was better than therapy for showing you what else life had to give. And if you were terribly depressed or had gone through some trauma, that that was the best way to heal you and that it would give you a better life, essentially. Okay. So none of this is strictly necessary, but more for if you're missing something or you need some help, then this is a place for you to find it. Yes. And she also had a sort of larger vision that now there's only a few individuals doing this, but slowly the whole of culture was going to move in this direction and that individuals doing occult work and connecting with these gods would bring larger changes in culture, which it's not unique to her, but I think it's quite unique to the forms of esotericism in that period, which were heavily involved with sort of nationalism and evolution narratives that she thought that she could bring about a, a rejuvenation of British culture, because this is the interwar period, through teaching people how to live better lives as occultists. So even though the novels are your personal area of expertise, You've actually chosen a reading from one of her more foundational texts. Could you tell us a little bit about what this work is and what the passage you've chosen talks about? This is called The Mystical Kabbalah, which she wrote in 1935. It's probably her most famous book, and it's still widely recognized as being an excellent introduction to the sort of late Western versions of mystical Kabbalah, which bears very little resemblance to early medieval or Jewish Kabbalah. It's entirely separate almost. But this is very nice because it talks about her relationship with Christianity. So she says that it will thus be seen that if Kita, which is the principle of the source of all being, is conceived of as the higher good, as it inevitably must be, and the nature of Kita is kinetic, and its influence is forever inclined towards chokma, which is the second spiritual principle. It inevitably follows that bina, which is the primary feminine principle, which is the opposite of chokma, is the perpetual opposer of the dynamic impulses and will always be regarded as the enemy of God, the evil one. Satan and Saturn is an easy transition, and so is time, death, and the devil. Implicit in ascetic religions such as Christianity and Buddhism is the idea that woman is the root of all evil, because she is the influence which holds men to a life of form by their desires. Matter is regarded by them as the antimony of spirit in an eternal, unresolved duality. Christianity is ready enough to recognize the heretical nature of this belief when it is presented to it in the form of antinomianism, but it does not realize that its own teaching and practice are equally antinomian when it regards matter as the enemy of spirit and as such to be abrogated and overcome. This unhappy belief has caused much human suffering in Christian countries as war and pestilence. Okay, so a lot to unpack there. I don't know how much it was understandable without the Kabbalistic context, but that was her account of, she really believed that godhood was 
was dual, that there was a sort of god and a goddess, and that the goddess was related with time and finitude and physical matter, and that in Christianity and Buddhism, it was often related as evil, but that truly understanding the body as evil was the source of suffering. Quite a big statement to make in 1935. And because people aren't accepting this dualism and instead connecting the idea of femininity and the body to evil, that is one of the root causes of suffering. But the higher principle would be that this very primary association of femininity with evil comes from femininity being associated with form. That is, you know, birth and creation and physical life, which also means death. And that's how that negative association comes about. Okay, so is the key goal there to stop being afraid of death? Suddenly, although I think more specifically not being afraid of the body is important. And But yes, I would say not being afraid of death because in the sort of symbolism of initiation, initiation is a death and then you're born to a new life, which she would even say the Christian narrative was an example of. And so there's this overcoming the fear of the unknown, of the body, of death, of all of this and embracing that there truly is a divine duality. I mean, her own life is almost like this death and rebirth. It seems like she had too many experiences and too many lives for just one person. She, I mean, she so I'm sure would have seen it that way. She believed that she was thrice born or that she was reincarnated. Um, and that was one of the reasons that she understood so much. But yeah, she lived a lot for a woman of the period. She was 40, 50 when she died. And she had, you know, already done, published all these books and trained as a psychoanalyst and run this group. And she still has a massive influence on paganism today. And I think that's really impressive. Yeah, I'm still so impressed that she was able to train as a psychoanalyst in the early 1900s. So she was a lay psychoanalyst at the clinic. The clinic was called the Medico-Psychological Clinic of London, and it was the first that was available to non-rich people. It was the first that was subsidized and that was available for middle-class people, and it was actually paid for by Mason Clare, who was a popular novelist of the time, and Dion Fortune. I suppose, had the contacts and was able to get in there and she took all the training. She wasn't allowed to become an official psychoanalyst because she was a woman, but she practiced as a lay psychoanalyst and gave lectures and such like. And interestingly, the clinic had a controversy where one of the top founders of it uh, had to go on record saying that they definitely did not do occultism there, which suggests that they probably did. <laughs> um, and she left not long after this precisely because she believed that Freudian psychoanalysis was deficient because it refused to recognize mystical impulses as being anything more than sexual. And she believed the opposite. She thought sexual impulses were truly mystical. And so she set off on her occult path as a sort of rectification or her answer to mystical psychoanalysis. I like that. That's a great origin story. And unfortunately, we saved it for the very end of the podcast. So we are at the end now, which means that there's only the one final question, which is, Georgia, why is Dion Fortune your favorite mystic? I like Dion Fortune. Again, I'm going to bring come back to this sort of Crowley issue. He is the perennial favorite of contemporary occultists as a source or a grandfather of, of what we do now as pagans and practitioners. And Fortune is sort of this forgotten figure of, she wouldn't have called herself a feminist, but I think she was. She really believed that if we were going to bring occultism into the world more broadly, that we had to do it in a way that was safe for women, that safeguarded them from being used and abused and brought into cults and hypnotized that safeguarded people from mental breakdowns because doing this kind of occult mystical work can really mess you up and she wanted to have ethical paradigms surrounding this work that would you know make it accessible and safe for people who weren't really rich middle class people who couldn't afford to go off and be mental somewhere or outrage convention and do something drastically shocking because they had to raise children or have a family or keep their job. And I thought that was just, even today, you get a lot of this in contemporary pagan culture, that the most shocking is the best, <clears throat> that the more convention breaking is the best, that true magicians don't care what society thinks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as a woman with a young child, I always thought that that was, you know, a very small minded approach to mysticism and I was fascinated by this woman who really thought or really tried to make practical accessible and ethical occultism I thought nobody else has really ever tried to do that in the same way yeah and, and I like also that 
she wrote crazy mystical stuff, but also was able to write novels and practical guides. And she was able to do a lot of different things. And she was able to channel her mystical experiences into these very practical things, which again, I think is not that often seen. Fantastic. And with that, we are at the end of the podcast. Georgia, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your work and the fascinating and complicated woman that was Dion Fortune. Thank you for having me and for listening to this sort of weird exploration of esotericism. <laughs> Not at all. It was great. And thank you all for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at MyFaveMystic. And join me next time when I speak to Alexandra Varini about Mirabai.